Good morning, everybody. All right, our church bell has been rung beautifully by Dennis. Thank you so much for calling the church to, to, to worship this morning. You know how we follow that up. I want to read to you guys this morning from the 51st Psalm as we begin our time of worship. So hear these words, if you would, in our call to worship this morning. Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12 declare this. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Amen. These are God's words as we open up our worship this morning. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we turn to you. We pray for your sustaining grace. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross for our sins. Lord, as we gather this morning and set our hearts to worshiping you, we pray that you will sustain us and grant us that ability to do so by filling us with your spirit, blinding us to the distractions of the outside world that are always vying for our attention and instead helping us to see only you, you and the cross you and your glory. Father, may our worship then this morning be pleasing in your sight. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. An opening word from the Lord, an opening prayer to him as well, and then an opening hymn, which is... 
ahead, take your seats, everybody. Well, welcome to another worship on a glorious spring, April morning. What a day. Well, we don't have many announcements, so that might speed things up even more. First and foremost, um, reminder of our women's Bible study on Monday mornings with Ann. A reminder of men's discipleship out Wednesday with me and cheeseburgers at the ministry building. <laughs> it should be going well. And then uh, Bible trivia is not going to happen this Wednesday. I know. It's a <laughs> crushing defeat. So no Bible trivia this week. It will be picked up in the month of May. Coffee's in the back. Restrooms behind us, cell phones on silent. What else we got? Any other announcements for the commencement? Sally? I do want folks to note that the Busky Day will be happening this year again for Saturday this week. Fourth Saturday in June. And then what happens the next day? Church anniversary. Fantastic. <laughs> Homecoming. So special times. Make sure you got that on your calendar. Great time to be here on the island. Um, Great time to be here with your church family as well. So, all right, if that is the bulk of our announcements, anybody know everybody here? I know some of you are pretty close. All right, to the extent that there's somebody here whose name you don't know, well, you should. So get up out of your seats, have a little time of fellowship. Let's see if we can end this time of fellowship where everybody knows everybody else. Take a couple minutes, would you?
enthusiastic fellowshipping this morning. But once again, your voices are primed. No quiz today on who you met because you know everybody. So instead, let's sing. What are we going to sing? Uh, the Hokey Pokey. <laughs> well, James was turning himself about earlier. So. Or microwave. Your microwave dance. Holy Spirit, you guys know this and we've done it a lot, so get your favorite and stuff, Holy Spirit. We're going to start, we're going to go through, so it's going to do it all the way through twice, and then we'll end with the last verse of just the chorus. We're going to do it twice all the way through, and then end with an extra chorus. You got this.
guys. All right, well, as we continue on then, it is our time for prayer requests, praise reports, testimonies. How are we doing as a church? What's going on? How can we be praying for each other, loving, walking alongside? Denny. Yeah, the, uh, the transfer up to Charleston was to get the valve repaired or replaced. So I haven't heard how that went. I didn't. Okay. So we'll keep praying for him. Yes, Pam. Um, Eddie, Eddie Hadler, I've gotten some updates. You might have gotten to hear him about um, Eddie and Karen. He ended up having to have a bi- triple bypass and a valve replacement. Mm-hmm. Um, but that he's on the road to recovery. All right. Oh, Sal. sister who's home she is in great pain and of course Linda who is continuing to pray for her my niece Cherry um, she was in the hospital I don't know if she got out yet but continue to pray for her and Lord I just want to just pray for all of us this world we need it God help us amen to that other prayer requests praise for Dennis Jim, I heard that maybe we should be praying for Connie some more. Well, she's getting better. Uh, it's been a long, long, quite a while now. Uh, she left April 27th last year from Arizona for her treatment center. And she's been back since October. She's been home since January. And she's getting up and down the steps a little bit. Uh, but the doctor's appointments have not been good. And uh, they just got never good when you need a transfusion after their blood tests. Okay. It's never good when you need a transfusion to recover from the blood test. That's true. <laughs> I've never heard of that many miles of blood. Mm. I went in this week for my Medicare uh, annual, and the doctor said he'd see me in next year, so I guess I'm okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Other prayer requests, praise reports, testimonies. Yes, Jim. They do 
other prayer requests, praise reports, testimony. <laughs> so my parents had quite the debacle yesterday with their plane. They were supposed to check off at 4.30. They ended up leaving Savannah um, after 9.30. Oh. Um, but they made it home. My dad got sick with the airplane flu. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, John. Um, this, this time I'm asking for prayers for a threesome. Uh, one of our friends, Linda, is suffering from cancer. And add to that our other two friends, Jill and Ray, also fighting cancer. Uh, Linda and Ray, the news isn't the greatest. Uh, Jill's hanging in there. Anyone else on this side of the church? <laughs> Jan. Um, just uh, quick report. I had a really nice visit with my sister. Um, I definitely had sex. Uh, but uh, she and I, you know, I was telling somebody that we have not lived in the same area. We haven't even lived in the same state in 30 years. And so our opportunities to get together have been. Anyone else? Okay. We've got a pretty straightforward list. So as we do every week, I'm going to lead us in prayer. I'm going to ask you also, while you are praying along, listen for the guidance of the Holy Spirit so that you will know which one of these prayer requests God wants you to take home with you and fold into your own daily time of prayer with the Lord. So let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for desiring this sort of relationship with us that we would come before you with the concerns of our hearts and bring them. And so, Lord, we come as your people. We come this morning and ask for your continued healing touch upon Mark White, that you would help him to recover from these heart challenges that he's having and surgeries. We pray the same for Eddie Havard, Lord, that as he recovers from his triple bypass and the valve replacement, that that you would expedite his healing. And with both of these men, Father, help them to rest while they recover and not charge back into the thick of things as they so often would do. Lord, we lift up to you our sister Sally. Pray for your sustaining and healing hand upon her. We lift up to you our sister Linda, who is fighting a hard fight but is in pain this morning. Lord, would you ease her pain and suffering and help her to just feel better? And for Terry, Lord, Help her to get stronger and out of the hospital as well. Lord, we have a world that is an absolute mess. And so we, we pray that in the midst of the darkness that is bearing down, that, that they would see the light that shines through your son, Jesus Christ, and come to it for, for healing, for truth, for sanity. Father, we want to lift up to you Dennis's nephew, Lanny Parsons, and Father, help him to recover from the stroke that he suffered last week as he gets back into therapy, may he recover use of those limbs that are struggling and be restored fully for his niece, Arroyo. Father, would you help her to recover from whatever it is that she is afflicted with, provide her with the healing and restore her completely. Father, we are grateful for the work that you have been doing in and through Connie, the healing that you have done brought, so, brought her so far. Would you continue? continue to help her regain her strength, her mobility, and restore her. For Samantha, Lord, we pray that those tests that were run on her would come back negative, that there would be no need for further healing because you will have healed her completely. But if they indeed show something, Father, help her to rest in you and help the doctors and nurses to know exactly the right treatment that you have in store for her. And for his daughter, Lord, as she prepares to begin life with a man chosen for her by the Lord, 
Father, I just pray that the two of them would walk hand in hand with you, that their lives as a married couple would be dedicated to exalting you as the King of Kings. Father, we do lift up to you those people who are suffering horribly in war-torn areas in the UK, Ukraine and Israel, throughout the Middle East and Gaza. Father, we just, you are the Prince of Peace, Lord, and in the midst of war, I just ask simply that people would realize that, that they need to turn to you. But would you provide comfort? Would you provide healing? Would you show us as your people the opportunities that you have given us to be your hands and feet to those who need to hear, to see, to feel? Lord, we rejoice that Jen's parents were able to, to have a wonderful time here. We praise you for bringing them back home safely. And as, as Jen's dad begins worship this morning, Lord, running on low energy, would you sustain him? Would you work through him and bless the congregation and then help them drive safely back home? For Linda, for Bill, and for Ray and their battles with cancer, Lord, again, there is no better source of healing than you. May they turn to you. May they rest in your arms. And would you just help them in this difficult time, Lord? And Father, thank you for letting Jan spend time with her sister. We praise you for those relationships, for the opportunities to, to work with those that you have given us influence over and with. And, and Father, I, I just rejoice that, that Jan and Shane are able to reconnect. So bless their time, and thank you for returning Jan safely to us. Lord, I know there are other, hearts, other prayers in our hearts and minds in here, but I thank you that you know everything, that you know our needs, and that you will do whatever is best and right for us. So we give you thanks and praise, Father, and we rejoice in you. In the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. We've got kids getting ready to go off to kids' programming. Just as we get ready for our time of offering. So as the kids are heading on out. Oh, wait, we've got a scripture reading. I guess that's me. I don't know the scripture reading not here. So I'll handle that part while you guys are... You can go. You don't, have, you don't have to stay for that. All right. So if you've been paying attention, you know that we continue to work our way through the book of Hebrews. So I want to read to you from Hebrews chapter 9 today. Read you verses 6 through 15 to give you a sense of where we're going later on today. Hebrews chapter 9. It's page 972 if you have any interest in following along in your Blue Pew Bibles. Hebrews 9, verses 6 through 15, proclaim this. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people who had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. There are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not a part of his creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifers sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more so, then, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who were called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. 
This is God's word, people. Amen. All right. And now, my understanding is we have Barbie coming to give us our offering music for the day. James and Ed, may I impose upon you gentlemen to pass the plates around this morning. As always, a reminder, we were having this discussion during fellowship time. You've all been so blessed. You all have gifts that are meant to be shared. And some of you may think your only gift is folding laundry, but I know it's so much more than that. So as you have these plates being passed around you, as you listen to Barbie being willing to play for us this morning, give some thought to the giftedness that God has poured into you so that you might then in turn bless the rest of us with just a glimpse of God's goodness and mercy. All right. I want to say a quick prayer over this. Sure. <clears throat> Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can be here in your house to worship you and hear the word preached. Lord, thank you that we were able to give a portion back. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless it to the needs of this church and to your will. We give you thanks, Father. We honor you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And in keeping with offerings and sharing blessings, Sally, got a song for us this morning. Yes. Um, folks, you know, I'm going to sing them by Riverside. I'm going to lay down my burden down by the riverside. Continuing along, I now would just ask as we prepare for this message, would you bow your heads and pray with me? Gracious Lord, now as we prepare for this message, would you empty me of myself? Would you get me out of your way, Lord, so that it is your word and your word alone that is proclaimed? Father, would your Holy Spirit be working in our minds so that as we hear these words, this message, we would receive it as you intend for us to understand it. And Father, would you be working in our hearts as well, setting our hearts on fire with a love for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So as we are continuing along in our walk through the book of Hebrews, I, I thought it was important this morning to stick, take a step back to take us all the way back, if you would, all the way back to the Garden of Eden, because I have this sense that something has been lost, something has been diminished in our culture and, as, in, and on us as people who live in this world, even as we're called to not be of it. And, and that is simply this. 
we are truly special. We are unique among all of God's creation. But we live in a society that is living out the tail end of the age of enlightenment, this time of scientific study and psychology and philosophy that tells us that really we are the end product of an unguided natural process of evolution. The conclusion of that line of thinking is that we are without purpose. We are not special. We are just a process, a product in that process that, oh, by the way, if it is true, is continuing to go forward beyond us. We think of ourselves as the pinnacle of it, but if it truly is the process that they're claiming to be, there's more to it. But the significant implication is that our lives have no meaning, no purpose, that if we are simply the result of an unguided evolutionary process, then we better make the most of our lives today because this is all we got. How we live in this society reflects that, doesn't it? Our lives reflect a desire to do what we want to do. Put another way, we're all sinners, aren't we? I mean, I, I'm not saying that our church here this morning is filled with people who have committed murder, people who have cheated on their spouses. But according to Jesus' terms on the Sermon on the Mount, we are. We are guilty of these things. We are murderers. We are adulterers. We are slanderers. We are gossipers. We are thieves. We are liars. We are sinners. And I haven't even gotten to the stuff, the good stuff that we're supposed to be doing that we don't do. I'm just talking about the bad stuff that we do. I mean, our lives are a product of a society that says it's okay and the scary thing about our society is that as it rejects this standard of absolute truth, it has completely rejected the notion that there is sin. And it is teaching us that a behavior that might seem taboo or bad, well, that's just because we haven't embraced it enough. But as we learn to tolerate it more and believe it's okay, then it will actually be okay. We've got a problem. It's not a problem if God didn't create us, if there is no God. Because if that's the case, there's no moral absolute. Anything goes. And that's why I take us back to the garden. Because in the garden, we hear about the creation. We hear that God created the heavens and the earth. He created all that is here on this planet. And then his pièce de résistance. He created man, and out of man he brought forth woman. And he gave man stewardship over the earth. He endowed man with traits and characteristics that reflected who God really is. Not merely a physical representation of a spiritual body, but the ability to love, the ability to know right from wrong, the ability to think. We are truly unique. We are truly special. And when God made Adam and Eve, desiring for that relationship to be right, God walked with them in the Garden of Eden. Now, Genesis doesn't tell us how long they walked with God without sin. Genesis tells us that they did walk with him, though. And can you imagine what that must have been like? The perfect relationship with God, realizing that God is the one who actually literally breathed life into you, informed you and made you as his own, to have that kind of knowledge in your head and in your heart, and then to walk with your creator. I can't even imagine how fantastic that relationship would have been. To know that every word uttered from the mouth of God was meant for my good. 
Because as the one who created all things, he knows the purpose for which he created all things, including me. How fantastic must that relationship have been? But then they sinned. They messed it all up. And God says, you do this and you die. And the reality is that there are two deaths that came about as a result of that. There is a physical death. There was a tree in the garden, the tree of life. And God said, before you eat of that, now that you've sinned, out. You will never eat of that tree. You will never have eternal life physically because you sinned and did that which I told you not to do. So there's a physical death that comes, but there's also a spiritual death. One of the ways of thinking about a spiritual death is the destruction of that relationship. Because ultimately, spiritual death means to be separated from God for eternity. We miss out on that unique relationship with the one that created us because of sin. God's desire was not that we be separated from him, but that we walk perfectly with him. How important is that relationship to him as opposed to anything else? Well, I, I read you this morning from Psalm 51, but let me read to you a couple of other verses from that. Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17 say this, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. <laughs> to phrase that a little bit differently, the prophet Micah wrote this in chapter 6. He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. You see, we sin. We messed up the relationship, and, and God said part of how we're going to reconcile this is going to be a system of sacrifices. There's going to be a system of cleansing. There's going to be a priest who will cleanse himself so that he can stand in the breach, keeping you from bringing your defiled presence into my holy glory. There had to be a priest who would offer up a sacrifice first and foremost for himself so that he could stand in that role. But the sinners of the world needed to come and make sacrifices. What God is saying through Psalm 51 and through Micah 6, 8 is, I didn't want there to have to be sacrifices. I wanted the perfect relationship with you, but you messed it up. And so we have to have these sacrifices, but wouldn't it have been so much better? if we had no need for them. God's plan was not for there to be sacrifices until it became necessary for there to be a plan that had sacrifices. What he wanted all along was a perfect, pleasing, obedient, loving relationship with us. And we couldn't do it. And so, we get to the question, how do we get beyond that? Hebrews here talks about why we needed Jesus to get beyond the system that God had imposed in the Old Covenant. In verse 8 of our reading, he says, The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the holy place, the most holy place, had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered we're not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings. External regulations implying until the time of the new offering. You see, the sacrificial offerings that were being offered could only be offered for the sins that they had committed. They couldn't be offered for the sins that they were going to commit the moment they left the temple. And they certainly couldn't be offered for the sins that were going to be committed the next day or the following day. The reality is, in order for them to be cleansed externally, there needed to be this perpetual system of sacrifices. 
And if they thought enough about their true state of mind and heart, the reality is they'd have been going back to the temple on multiple occasions every single day. Say, I'm sorry, God. I screwed up again. Take another heifer. Take another goat. Take another dove. Blood shed because we keep on sinning in the brokenness of our relationship. That is what we do. The sacrificial system that was in place back then could only address the external. It wasn't good enough to address the inside, the condition of our heart. For that, we needed one whose relationship with God reflected the relationship that God desired from all of us. One who was without sin because he did nothing but what God told him to do. Said nothing but what God told him to say. Spent time subjecting himself to whatever God's will for him was. Even if that meant going to the cross. In order for there to be a sacrifice sufficient to cleanse the inside, there had to be one who needed no cleansing on the inside and no cleansing on the outside. There had to be one who was perfect, who had that relationship that we were called to emulate, and there was only one who could do that. Jesus, the Son of God. It was his blood shed that we needed. His blood that could cover up our sin. His blood that would allow us to be able to stand before God as if we had not sinned. Now, a reasonable question that's been asked by many times is, okay, couldn't Jesus have just gone to the blood bank, donated a pint, and then taken that and sprinkled it on the altar and said, we're all good? The reality is when you read about blood in the scriptures, it is life. Deuteronomy says, only be sure that you do not eat the blood, for the blood is the life, and you shall not eat the life with the flesh. The call for a blood sacrifice was the call for a life to be given. Hebrews goes on to tell us a little bit more clearly. He says, if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God to purify our conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. So it had to be his blood. It had to be his life. But verse 15 then says, therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For there is a will where there is a will involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. It was the death of Jesus that brought that covenant into effect, full force and effect. Jesus had to die for us. He had to make that sacrifice for us. He had to die so that we might live. But what about those who died under the old covenant? What about those who died before Christ began his worldly mission? Before they knew who Jesus was? How could we hold them to account? Well, that's why we get back to this nature of a relationship. Because there were people living under the old covenant who understood that their relationship was broken and yet they desired to walk with God. They desired to be right with God. They knew that God had given them a plan. A plan that involved coming to the temple. A plan that involved sacrifice. A plan that involved worship. And they, having not seen Jesus, not knowing Jesus, put their full faith and trust, not in Jesus whom they didn't know, but in God who they did know. And they trusted God that the sacrifices laid forth before were the best way available to them 
to reach the promised Messiah. To get to the point where that suffering servant in Isaiah chapter 53 would come and pay the price for our iniquities, for our transgressions. They trusted that the word of God fully revealed a plan even if they hadn't yet seen it fully revealed. They put their faith in him. So that verse 15, let me read it again to you. It says, therefore, he is a mediator of the new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. God was saying, all I want is that relationship with you. And if that relationship involves you trusting me for your salvation, I've got you covered so that when Jesus does come around, you're not lost. But once Jesus arrives, your faith better be in him because he is the fulfillment of my plan. And so what that means is that all the sinners that walked the earth that had put their trust and faith in God's plan were covered when Jesus came to fulfill that plan. If they were trusting in God to restore them and then died, when Christ died on the cross and said it was finished, they were set free. And that's where we are. John 3.16 tells us this. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish. Let me stop you right there. That is mind-blowing. That is crucial. That alone is worth rejoicing. To know that if we put our faith in God, if we believe in Jesus given for us that we shall not die. To know that we won't die is something that we should rejoice over. But he says something more than that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Sometimes we can just jump up and down on this notion that we're not going to die. But in place of that, we get eternal life. Jesus said, I came so that you would have life and have it abundantly. Don't just rejoice that you're not marked for death. Rejoice that you have been marked to walk hand in hand with God. Again. Go back to the garden, the creator, that perfect relationship, that understanding that the one who breathed life into you created you for a purpose. We'll tell you what that purpose is, but part of that purpose is walking with him every single day. And that's why it's not simply enough for us to rejoice that we have been saved. We need to walk with God. Because that relationship has been restored. That gift of being able to know that we are held in the hands of the creator of the universe who then invites us to call him Abba, Father. To talk to him. To seek his face. The restoration of that relationship brings about a joy in our heart that merely knowing that we're not going to die doesn't cover. Because now we know how to live. So if you want Jesus for your salvation, that's great. That's a wonderful start. But he intends so much more for you. Because he's restored you. And he wants you to walk with him. He wants you to talk to him. He wants you to have an intimacy with God that surpasses our understanding of intimacy in this world. The one who knew you before he even formed you in your mother's womb invites you to walk with him. 
And the remarkable thing about all of this, this relationship that has been a common thread through scripture, through the Old Testament, through the promise of a plan of salvation, the restoration of this relationship comes through Christ alone. There is no other way that our relationship with God is restored. There is no other person who models what that relationship is meant to look like. It is Christ alone. Christ alone lived the life. Christ alone died the death. Christ alone was the sacrifice that could cleanse us from our sin. And so what the author of Hebrews wants us to know so dearly is that under the old system, there was a veil that separated the place of worship from the holiest of holies, that separated the defiled people from a holy God. And when Christ died on the cross, his death alone was sufficient to tear that veil in two, to remove the barrier that kept us from having the relationship with God that we were created to have. Christ's death alone restores that relationship and makes it possible. And if that's the case, then it is through Christ and Christ alone that we should hold on for our salvation and for abundant life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for sending your son to do that which we never could do. We thank you that you love us so much that you would send him to the cross so that we might be restored to you. Lord, would you help us to rejoice in that? Would you help us to see you afresh in a way that we might never otherwise be able to see you? And may our hearts be filled with joy and gladness so that seeking after your will and following your commands is not some law that we must obey. But it becomes the joy of our hearts to serve you with love. May we rejoice in you always. And may it always be through your son, Jesus Christ alone. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, now we've got ourselves a closing song. All right, second sheet in Christ alone. When you have it, be seated.
Since you're all standing now, how about a closing benediction? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit rest, abide, and remain in each and every one of you. And in so doing, may he grant you that amazing capacity to go forth from here to truly love your neighbor as yourselves. And the church all said, Amen. You have entered to worship, depart to serve. Everybody have a blessed week. <laughs>